and I'm City Councilor Lydia Edwards, Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Uh, it is Tuesday, October 5th, and we are here today for a virtual hearing on docket 0567, ordered for a hearing regarding biannual review of the Boston Employment Commission and Boston Residents Jobs Policy. I sponsored this matter and was referred to the committee on April 14th, 2021. Under the terms of the ordinance, the City Council is required to hold a biannual review of the policy. The last hearing was held on April 21st, 2021. The ordinance establishes standards and compliance requirements for applicable city funded projects and construction projects where a percentage of the workers must be Boston residents, people of color and women. At previous hearings, the committee discussed the city's progress in achieving the objectives of the ordinance as well as programs and initiatives implemented by the city to improve the numbers. The committee discussed the use of Salesforce as a data platform, the CSL prep course, the jobs bank, the creation of hiring a full-time Salesforce administrator and adding construction monitors to ensure that projects are in compliance. The committee also discussed the city's efforts in creating pipelines to trades, potential changes in state law, and the legal standards that are used when awarding contracts. At the hearing held in April, the committee reviewed investments made by the city to improve and ensure compliance with the BRJP. The committee also discussed the use of Salesforce, excuse me, and, I'm oh, sorry, adding four construction monitors for a total of seven to ensure that the projects are in compliance. In accordance with Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, uh, we are modifying the open meeting law and we're having this hearing via Zoom. The public may watch this hearing via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city desk council desk TV and on Xfinity 8 RCN 82 and Verizon 964. It will be rebroadcasted at a later date. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.go at boston.gov. If you would like to offer public comments and have not signed up, you may do so with, uh, please email christine.odonnell at boston.gov. Participating today on the administration's behalf is Chief Selena, Selena Barrios Milner, Equity and Inclusion Cabinet, uh, Mr. Christopher Brown, uh, Manager of Boston Residence Job Policy, Andre Lima, Deputy Director of Supplier Diversity and Boston Residence Job Policy, and Dominique Williams, Deputy Director, Office of Equity. I believe we're also joined by Travis Watson, will be testifying as well. Um, and um, and I, if I missed anybody, Kim, are you here uh, for testimony or answering questions? No, I'm not here for testimony or answering questions. Okay. I um, just want to acknowledge we've been joined um, by Councillor Mejia and Councillor Braden, Councillor Flynn as well, and Councillor Bach. And I think I have all the counselors. If I've missed anybody, my apologies. I'm gonna actually go ahead and turn it over. Um, I believe counselor, in order of arrival, we have counselor Mejia, then counselor um, Braden, then counselor Flynn, then counselor Bach. I could be, if I'm wrong with that, just go ahead and text me, but we're gonna do some quick opening remarks and go right to the administration. And then after the administration, Travis, you'll go as well. Okay, okay. Councillor Mejia. May have some connection issues. So, Councillor Braden. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to hear um, an update on how we're doing with our Boston Jobs Policy. Um, this is critically important, and I know you all agree. Um, we need to uh, have jobs available and, and have our local people in Boston employed in all these construction jobs so that they can get the economic benefits of all this, um, this incredible boom we're in. So I look forward to the conversation and thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, for chairing this important meeting to the panelists as well for the important work you're doing as Councillor Braden mentioned, I'm here to listen to the testimony, but just wanted to add that this is a critical policy that the city has. Boston jobs for Boston residents, women and people of color, critical getting, getting them into the uh, booming economy, but also the compliance is also critical. I'm also interested in hearing more about um, an issue that I continue to hear over the last several years, wage theft that continues to happen in the city of Boston. It does have an impact on this. There should be zero tolerance for wage theft 
in the city of Boston. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, for sharing this important um, meeting. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Bach and then Councillor Mejia. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, and I'll apologize in advance that I have to be in transit for part of this meeting. Um, so I probably, um, I'll be listening for much of it. But um, just wanted to echo my colleagues uh, and say, you know, I think this is really, it's an economic engine that the city presides over. Um, and so it's super important that it be inclusive. It's super important to Councillor Flynn's point um, that our construction jobs be good jobs, that they be safe. That's something that council focused a lot on, that they're not be wage theft. Um, you know, I think a lot of the union protections that we pride ourselves on in Boston are important. And so I guess my, my biggest question for these hearings is always not just, um, not just like, you know, looking at the numbers and seeing that we have a problem, because I know that we do, um, but really asking like, what's the pathway that makes this happen, um, that changes this and sort of really drilling down on um, what would move the needle on this issue. So looking forward to hearing on that front as well, because I just think it's uh, it's so important for the city's shared prospect, prosperity and for combating inequality that we figure this out. Um, and uh, and we've, to do that, we've got to get down below the top line number. So here for that. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Mejia. Um, yes, good morning, everyone. Sorry for my technical glitch, um, but thank you to the chair for calling this hearing. And as the chair of um, workforce development, um, ensuring that residents, particularly women and people of color have access to good paying jobs is critical um, to building wealth and capital in our city. Um, there are some contractors who are committed to the work of following the law and creating a pathway to stable employment for women and people of color. But there are also some contractors who don't care about the law and they um, do what they want. Um, I hope to find out uh, through this hearing what we can do as a city to make sure that we are um, only hiring contractors who follow the law and who are committed to hiring residents, um, uh, Boston residents, women and people of color. And, you know, I I've been getting tagged on photos from construction sites. Um, I, I just don't understand how we are still having the this conversation and every quarter we come back and we we hear the same thing. And I just feel like at some point something has to give um, and we need to uh be a little bit more aggressive about the accountability piece because people are just getting tired of the lip service here. And so I'm hoping that uh, we can walk out of this with some commitments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, um, sorry, we will turn it now over to the administration. I did want to acknowledge that um, some of our uh, other testimony, well, the Boston Jobs Coalition is signed on to speak and also um, Let's see, I think we also have as uh, participants who will be um, asked to speak from the public, uh, Dick Monks as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Chief uh, Selena Barrios Milner, and uh, you'll guide us through, I guess, all the administrative testimony, correct? Excellent, yes. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Edwards, for holding this important review. And thank you to Councilors Braden, Mejia, Bach, Flynn um, and Flynn for, for being here. I really appreciate your commitment to ensuring that Boston residents have access to quality jobs and construction in their backyard through city funded projects um, and really appreciate your partnership um, on this work and, and, you know, share a lot of the frustrations and hopes for this program as well. Um, since we last met, we've been working, and, and we'll talk a little bit in further detail during our presentation, but we've been working to um, flesh out both the sanctions policy for the Boston Employment Commission um, so that commissioners can issue sanctions at the, at the BEC, um, which we, we ran into sort of a legal hurdle um, and when trying to implement the, ex the existing ordinance. Um, so we are working on that. Um, and we are also working on a policy for creating a list of, um, of contractors that are out of compliance with the, with the policy. Um, and that's what you call the, the record of non-compliance so that city buyers can review that list prior to awarding contracts and, and if uh, possible, 
avoid working with those contractors. Um, those are the real tools that that the ordinance provides. And um, as you know, we we talk about often here, and we talk about with our commissioners and community advocates. The ordinance, the limitations of the ordinance are that we have um, we are able to. Um, issue sanctions for lack of compliance, which is not does not necessarily correlate with the numbers themselves. And so um, people are rightfully frustrated when the numbers don't move up. But what we can sanction on is whether contractors are acting in good faith and submitting weekly reports, trying to find workers, calling the union halls or calling other um, sources of workers for non-union projects um, to find those workers. And that's what that's what we sort of grade them on, right? That's what we can sanction them on. And I think that is um, a limitation when you look at the numbers, um, you can have someone that's in great compliance, but has terrible numbers. And so I think that that's a, a tension of the policy that's, that's really hard for us, um, continuously hard for us to manage. Um, so the other piece that, uh, that wanted to flag for you. We are moving all of our projects now onto Salesforce. We have a great um, contractor on board and this will really ease not just our ability to um, monitor projects in real time, but also the ability of um, commissioners, counselors, and, and members of the public to have a better understanding of how projects are doing. So we are we're now moving all new projects onto Salesforce and we have, um, Andre Lima here, if there's uh, questions later about the Salesforce platform itself. Um, so that's, you know, um, we're really looking forward to, to working with you all on, on really bringing the spirit of this ordinance to, to life, not just the, the letter of the ordinance, which we're working on dutifully every day. Um, so um, today I'll be um, sharing um, just some updates and Chris Brown will be sharing the um, the latest numbers, and then we will turn it over to Chair Watson to talk about um, the Boston Employment Commission. It's, he's the, the chair of the commission. The rest of my team is here to help answer questions um, as they come up. So I don't know if you want me to just go through the, the updates now or if you want to continue doing um, openings. Sorry, you can continue. Okay. Um, if we could pull the slides up, please. And I promise I'll be brief because I really want, want I'm eager to hear from, from you all and, and those in the audience. Thank you, and we can move. Um, I'm gonna actually turn it over to BRJP manager, Chris Brown, to go over um, the latest numbers. Um, so we can we can click forward a couple of slides. Um, all right, go ahead, Chris. Excellent, uh, thanks chief and good morning council. Uh, so we are looking at the last six months. Um, so that would be April 2020, uh, 21 up until September 2021. We've had 115 active projects. Uh, 27 of those projects are private projects. Those projects are over 100,000 square feet. Most of those projects are located downtown Boston and the Seaport area. We've had 88 city of Boston projects. Those are projects that are funded um, entirely by the city or partially by the city. So with the uh, public facilities department, we've had 31 projects. Um, that's a department that deals with city properties, uh, parks and recreation, city parks, seven, that's seven projects, public works, that would be streets, roads, sidewalks, 22 projects. And the, the Department of Neighborhood Development, the housing, affordable housing division, we had 28 projects. Um, in regards to the numbers, um, as you know, we have a new ordinance that was established in 2017. And most of the projects that we have uh, in the department now are, are all under the new ordinance. 
So if you take a look of, at the work hours for the new ordinance projects, as opposed to all projects, uh, which would include new and old ordinance, you can see that the hours are, are almost meeting up. Uh, so I would say within the next six months to a year, all projects will be under the new ordinance. Um, some projects are still under the old ordinance because uh, they, the projects were grandfathered in uh, before the new ordinance was signed. But 95% of the projects that we have now are under the new ordinance. And you can take a look at the numbers for the new ordinance projects. We're at 27% Boston resident, 40% people of color, 7% female. And then we have the percentages for the new and old um, projects combined at 26% resident, 38% people of color, and 7% women. Uh, next slide, please. And this gives you a breakdown of active projects by neighborhood. Uh, as you can see, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but you can take a look at all the different projects in all, within the different neighborhoods of Boston. The last column, it says various locations. That would be like, sometimes you might have a, a contract uh, for uh, public works, and it would include various streets. For example, they would be performing work on Blue Hill Ave, and at the same time, the contract would also be performing work, say, on Cummings Highway. So a project under those circumstances would be listed as uh, various pro various locations. And this gives you a breakdown of the city projects. Uh, we have Again, we have four different city departments. Uh, the neighborhood development uh, department, that, that's the department that always have has the most um, the out work hours. Um, and in this case, 359,000 hours 30% resident, 68% people of color, 7% women. And then you have public facilities in second place, 160,000 hours, 35% uh, resident, 43% people of color, 7% women. Um, and then you have the public works at 24, 30, and 3. And parks, parks is uh, a small department, usually seven projects a year. They're at 21, uh, 26, and 4. Uh, next slide, please. All right, I think that's it for my testimony for now. Thanks so much, Chris. And I'll just uh, quickly go over uh, some of the work of the Jobs Bank um, over the, since we last met. We can go on to the next slide. Um, my apologies. Um, this shouldn't be here. Um, just look on my end. So, um, my apologies. Um, it it looks like the, this slide deck is out of date. Um, I'll just uh, give an update from our jobs bank coordinator that we're planning a job fair from um, on October 13th next week uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, and that'll be on 2103 Washington Street. That's in partnership with Wynn Residential uh, that they'll be seeking and hiring building maintenance personnel. Um, and then if we can just move to the Boston Employment Commission's update. Updates, sorry. Um, and I'll just do a quick update before I turn it over to Chair Watson. Um, so we have um, stood up as we discussed in our last hearing, um, the um, a working group to implement a BEC sanctions policy. The policy takes uh, what's in the ordinance and creates an official commission policy. And that, that's what we need to have in place so that when we issue sanctions, there's clears, uh, clear appeals processes in place um, and uh, a clear criteria for how sanctions are issued and the um, 
the magnitude of those sanctions. Um, what it, so we've had one working group meeting. The next one is tomorrow. Um, the working group is comprised of BRJP staff, uh, BEC commissioners, as well as community advocates. Um, and part of the the nuance that I think you know you all. Uh, would appreciate and we would love to have your input as well is that um, the way the ordinance is written we're able to issue fines up to three hundred dollars in a lot of cases but that up to gives us the room to actually have some uh, determination as to what fine is appropriate and so what's been raised by by members of our working group is that, for example, if you have a smaller project or a smaller contractor, should they bear the same burden that a large contractor does when they're out of compliance? Um, if it's a first time offense versus a repeated his, you know, history repeating itself over and over. Um, if people are meeting most of the goals, right? If they're hiring local workers, they're hiring people of color, but they're late on sending their paperwork in, are we gonna hit them with a $10,000 fine, right? So these are the types of determinations that it seems really clear cut, but when you get into the actual um, projects that we review, um, we wanna make sure we have really clear objective criteria that are applied uniformly uh, across projects. So that's really the, the meat of the conversation. Um, and we hope to have um, another working group meeting and ambitiously hope to vote on it in this month's Boston Employment Commission, but depending on the working group, it might be in the next uh, Boston Employment Commission. Once the policy is finalized, we present it to the full commission um, and they then take a vote on it. And what, if, they, if they approve it, then that becomes the new policy of the BEC. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Chair Watson for his testimony. Thank you all very much. Good morning, counselors. I appreciate the invitation to speak today. And what will be my last address to you as a commissioner, I'll use my time today to share with you all the history of the Boston Residence Jobs Policy, or what I refer to as Boston's Black Worker Jobs Policy that never was. See, the origin of the Boston Residence Jobs Policy was job creation for Black workers, not residents and women. As you all know, the Boston Residence Jobs Policy sets a hiring expectations for Boston's public and private development over 50,000 square feet. Created in 82, it calls for 51% of the total work hours to go to residents, 40% people of color, 12% women. Many people do not realize that the original architects of the ordinance were trying to secure jobs for black people, not residents and women. According to former white union carpenter, Mark Ehrlich, they only included residents and women to quote, make it palatable to Boston politicians. The roots of the BRJP go back to the late 1960s with the creation of the federal government's Model Cities program. Boston's version, the Boston Urban Redevelopment Program, also called BURP, was supposed to create jobs and opportunities for black workers on small scale residential and rehabilitation projects and pair them with veteran workers veteran union workers for training. However, after about a week or so of work, quote, all the black guys were laid off and all the French Canadians were kept, remembers Leo Fletcher, a carpenter on the job. Somebody from out of our city, even out of our country, getting paid to do work that I could do in my community, end quote. Frustrated by the lack of opportunity, Fletcher and other black workers created the United Community Construction Workers, or UCCW, to plan ways to get construction jobs in their neighborhoods. One of their primary strategies was construction site protests. Former black construction worker Omar Cannon recalls that, quote, we had to go to the point of production, stop the job and negotiate right on the spot. We even had people go on the job, pick up tools and start going to work without getting paid. Some guys actually got hired like that. What worked best on any job that came into this community was to iron out an agreement before they broke ground. They were promised to take a certain amount of people through the UCCW, end quote. The BERT program failed to create anywhere close to the kind of impact the federal government was looking to achieve. As a result, in 1970, they invested close to 700,000 in a new program called the Hometown Plan, which promised to bring 2,000 people of color into union building trades over five years. But like BERP, the hometown plan failed to meet its hiring targets. In response, black construction activists like Chuck Turner and Leo Fletcher 
used funds made available through the U.S. Department of Labor's Manpower Training Act to launch a third world jobs clearinghouse to act as a resource for construction companies in need of black workers. As part of its work, the clearinghouse organized similar construction site protests utilized by the UCCW. They grew in frequency and successfully stopped work on multiple projects around the city. Because construction workers get paid by the hour for work performed, each construction site shutdown meant lost wages for white union workers. Tensions rose to a boiling point at the Barletta pumping station project when white union construction workers joined forces with members of the South Boston Marshals, an anti-busing paramilitary group, and clashed with protesters. And finally boiled over on May 7th, 1976, when roughly 3,000 white union construction workers marched on Boston City Hall. They've demanded protection from the protesters and for the city council to defund Chuck's Clearinghouse. Mayor Kevin White responded to the demands by ordering a tactical police team to descend upon a site of frequent protests, the Madison Park High School project. The mission was twofold, protect the white union workers and intimidate the black activists. Police patrolled the sidewalks around the school, guarded the entrance to the site, even placing sharpshooters on the roof of the building. When cooler heads prevailed, Chuck Turner and his allies went back to the drawing board. They tried to differentiate between white workers looking to put food on the table and union leaders and union leadership and policies that kept black people from becoming union members. They formed the Boston Jobs Coalition. According to Chuck, quote, we saw the only thing that would save affirmative action in the trades was an alliance with white Boston residents to break the political ties that the suburban based unions had with the city council, end quote. In 1983, Mayor White established an ordinance establishing the Boston Residence Jobs Policy, at that time calling for 50% of city-funded construction project hours going to residents, 25% to minorities, and 10% to women. The work that laid the path toward creating the BRJP was done by Black workers and activists trying to get construction jobs for Black workers. Residents and women were only added to the policy to appease white union members and politicians. I'll end with a quote by the great Black American writer and thinker, Charles Blow, from his masterpiece, The Devil You Know. Quote, time, energy, and passion are limited commodities in life. Every minute I spend trying to fix the flaw in another is a minute I take away from loving my family, being in my community, and doing my work. I refuse to give racism my minutes. Furthermore, it is outrageous to expect the oppressed to heal the oppressor. That, in fact, is another form of oppression." End quote. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, incredible testimony, powerful. And um, I hope it orients our moral compass to the actual goals and we remember who's lived and died in trying to get those done. I really appreciate you also bringing up Chuck, Chuck Turner's name, Travis. And I know I could see in you physically, this was, it was a long time coming. Yeah, right on. Um, I also wanted to jump in, Chair Edwards, just to thank Travis Watson for his incredible service as chair for the past six years and as commissioner um, under three different administrations at this point, um, really your um, experience and expertise and very strong moral compass have really helped guide our work. And we hope that we can continue to reach out to you as an expert, um, but also respect you stepping back into um, all of your other responsibilities that you have. So thank you so much, Travis. It's been a tremendous honor. Thank you. I would like to do the same. I would like to thank Travis. Um, I appreciate your your passion um, for making sure that people of color, Boston residents, and uh, women are working on these projects. And uh, to you know, it's been an honor for me to work with you. Um, I know that you care about the program. I know that you care about the city, and I really appreciate all the support that you've been able to provide. Thank you, Chris. And I, I apologize to the council that I, I did not mean to take us off course um, in, in this way whatsoever. That was not my intention. On the on the contrary, I don't know why my camera's sideways all of a sudden. 
Uh, but on the contrary, uh, you actually, if anything, you set us on the right course again. You remind us where we came from and where we need to go and our commitments and why we need to fight so hard to keep them going. So um, I can, you know what, because we have the Boston Jobs Coalition also, who I think it would be wonderful actually at this point to bring them into the conversation because they were there in many cases along with this movement um, and to see if any of the, uh, the Boston Coalition, Boston Jobs Coalition, um, if I'm, I'm sorry, Chief, did you have another person to testify? No, okay. So we're gonna bring in the, the Jobs uh, Coalition and Dick Muntz for their testimony, and then we'll do a round of questions with, this, with the counselors. So we can bring them in as, um, I think that's, okay, good. And I think Angela might be with the, the um, Angela, yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. And then also Dick Monks, so they should all be set to go. Angela, the Boston Jobs Coalition, you're set to speak. You can just unmute yourself. Oh. <clears throat> okay, we can hear you. Angela, do you want to go ahead? Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning. I first would like to thank Mr. Travis Watson for that wonderful delivery, that historic presentation of where we came from and I am gonna to say today, we still are. Many changes has not taken place at all, but your passion is so revealing. This is not the first time I've heard you speak, but oh my gosh, if everyone on this call and if everyone that fight these fights to bring about changes could just have a, 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 a small centimeter of your passion and understanding of what we need to do to stop the disparity that's taken place in our community. There is enough work for everybody. Why is this such a dissension that there is this great divide be be between the haves and the have not? That is so shameful in a city that's rich. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Now, I was gonna give a little history, but after you just, after that, I need not give a history of where we came from, what Chuck Turner and those before him have done. But what I want to know at the end of the day, I heard um, Selena speak about um, acting in good faith. Acting in good faith is open to interpretation. Exactly what does that mean? Because if I write a grant, I write a proposal, I'm building a development, a project, what have you, it's my interpretation of good faith. Whether I sent out a letter, I pound, whether I pound the pavement, whether I called all the community, um, organizations in, in, in the area, whatever I do, how little or large, that's my interpretation of good faith. I sit with many on the BRJP in Nubian Square. We, we meet continuously and there isn't a meeting where we are not upset or like wondering why doesn't these numbers change? The slide that was shown earlier showed that there are 15 active projects in Roxbury. Yet every time there is a BRJP's meeting, it's the, the numbers don't move. Why is that? I understand that there is hesitation and sanction. I also understand that there is, there's no one size fit all. But why don't we have a, um, a, a chart 
that shows you, for lack of better words right now, I'm just going to say the bad players, you know, those whose numbers don't go up, those, those whose numbers don't change. Why are they not called in or at the table to say, okay, what is your practice? We can't keep doing the same thing the same way and expect and, it, and, and expect something different. These, our residents in Roxbury, Greater Roxbury, this is their, these are their lives that we are playing with. And I say playing with because th this is just the spirit of the letter. This is just words on paper. They are not being practiced. And that's what has to change. So my question is, can we get data showing the history of the various developers doing work in Greater Roxbury? And I say Greater Roxbury because we know Roxbury get, has gotten divided with the 02121 and the 02119 and all of that. But Greater Roxbury, what we know to be Roxbury historically, um, because that's the only way we are going to truthfully understand what's going on. We need to see that diagram in front of us. And that, that's, that's my question moving forward. Um, the gentleman, I'm sorry, I do not remember your name, sir. Uh, Christopher, I believe is his name, spoke of a new ordinance. I'm a little confused. What's the new ordinance versus the old ordinance? So if someone could speak to that, that would be very helpful. And as it relates to those who are invited to the working group for a revised policy, I hope Boston Jobs Coalition is going to be at that table. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity. Mr. Watson, again, bravo to you. Bravo. Thank you so much for, for those kind words, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Um, I, unless someone else from the Boston Jobs Policy was going to speak, I was going to turn it over to Dick Monks. Okay. Dick? Okay, thank you. Um, I wasn't really, and I hadn't prepared a testimony today, but I'm not going to give up an opportunity to say a few words. Um, first, I want to uh, echo Angela's words and, and congratulations to Travis. I My experience with Travis is that he's been a reliable and sturdy voice in terms of not losing the overall mission of the BRJP. And it takes someone with some uh, strength and courage to carry on for six years. And he sees these numbers and has seen these numbers um, not move very much. And uh, yet he continued to all the way through be a voice for we can do it, we can do it. And so Travis, thanks a lot. We've had some personal words already, but I just do really want to thank you for for your uh, work during your tenure. Thank you so much, Dick. It's been very meaningful. Good. And um, I just have a couple points, I guess I made from hearing the presentation this morning. I'd like to ask Chris, maybe next time, I'm not looking to go back today, but when we give the numbers for the last six months, it might be helpful for those of us who want the greatest note keepers or record finders, because I know I wrote it down six months ago, but to be able to present what the numbers were in April and what they are in October, um, that that would give a visual as to just what has happened and what hasn't happened. And I, I am looking forward to working on the working group. I have been participating in those meetings and I will be there tomorrow for the next uh, working group session. And um, I just, I think I wanna end with, because of the history we learned today and, or, or at least heard again today about the beginning days and the, and the political decision to expand the original BIJP plan to include Boston residents as well as women. And yes, it was the tactical decision that needed to uh, unite the political forces necessary to succeed, but it's also, very interesting and you know working alongside Chuck Turner in his last days he was as active as he was in the, in the 70s and the 80s as he was in the 2020s and he was and he was uh, you know Travis knows his first hand from being in meetings with him he was relentless in uh, pushing for uh the changes from the unions which i think we've had some 
awareness happening there. Hopefully the, the, it, that will continue. But more importantly, Chuck was very adamant, and it's interesting that the numbers that have been the least improvement over the last 40 years are in fact the Boston residents. And, and, be, and that really means white Boston residents. And I know there's a lot of factors as to why that number continues to be in the mid to low mid twenties and the other numbers have crept up, but not enough to, to, to satisfy. But, and there are factors about people moving out of the city about, uh, you know, the, the, the desire by so many young people to want to work in front of a computer screen all day, as opposed to wielding a hammer. I don't quite get that myself, but, um, Nonetheless, Chuck saw that as an important uh, piece to work on just as much as uh, continuing to push for the b better numbers and uh, communities of color and uh, women. So um, with that, I think I made one other note. No, that's it. All right. I just want to, again, thanks Travis. Thank this committee. Um, I'm curious to see who will be the next chair of the, if that hasn't been decided yet, I'll be curious to see. But um, the struggle continues. Very good, thank you. Well, thank you all for your commitment to decades of work and I appreciate that and your leadership. Uh, Travis, you raised your hand. Please, um, it, this, this is outside of my pay grade and absolutely not my call, but I can't really get in much trouble because I'm resigning my post. Um, <laughs> totally understand, again, this is not my decision. But I want to just go on record at noting that I strongly encourage whatever administration is empowered to um, uh, select the next chair that they strongly consider a woman for the position. Um, I think it's time for a fresh set of ideas. The commission, as far as I know, has been chaired by a, a male since its inception. Um, again, I just think it's time for some fresh ideas, some fresh perspectives, uh, and I just strongly encourage the next administration to consider a woman, particularly a woman of color. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, feel free to just raise your hand, and we'll be we'll be ready <laughs> throughout. Trip. I'm just gonna we're just gonna give you the mic back whenever you 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 need it. Okay. Um, we're gonna turn now over to uh, counselors uh, for. <clears throat> In order of arrival, I think Councillor uh, Mejia, then Councillor Braden, Councillor Flynn, and Councillor Bach. Um, thank you, Councillor Edwards. Um, in incredibly um, encouraged by not just the passion, but the, the steadfast conviction to move in the conversation beyond the conversation here in terms of accountability. I think we are um, well beyond that. But I just have a few questions for the administration. Um, the, um, the stats on the boston.gov website are still from September 2020. And so I'm just curious of how often do we publish compliance data and when, when they'll be refreshed? And then the last time we held this hearing, I brought up a contractor who routinely disobeys the BRJP um, and fails on nearly every compliance measure that we have put in place. Um, this contractor is Mario Susi and Sons. I checked the BRJP website and found that as of last month, um, they're still being contracted through the city. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the enforcement mechanisms that you are planning to put in place and how many times does a contractor have to break the rules before they are put on notice? Um, what, are, um, what good is our um, BRJP policy if we keep on letting it fall through the cracks? And then lastly, can you just talk a little bit about how the city is partnering with local unions specifically when it comes to compliance um, around the B? Are JP? So I'll take um, part of your questions and then uh, turn it over to um, Chris Brown. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we have the right, that you're looking at the right data. The, we have a, a year in review that, that we'll update at the end of, of this year, but we also have the um, link to the compliance report, which should take you to the live data that's being pulled from the ac currently access and soon to be Salesforce database. So I'll, we'll work with your office to make sure that you have the right, uh, that you have the current data. And then um, 
I don't know, Andre, if they if they sort of push it on. I know Councillor Mejia said that it was last updated in September, so I don't know if they might need to do if they have to do manual pushes because it is access. So we'll get you. We'll make sure that um, I, my my understanding is that it's live data, but I don't know if they have to do you know regular pushes. Um, do you have a quick answer on that, Andre? On the analyze. Um, I don't, but I can certainly check in with the. Um, I can certainly check in with the analytics team to make sure that um, if if I'm, both that if there hasn't been a push recently that that's performed, but also um, to make sure that a recurring push is is just set up because that's something that should just happen automatically. Yeah. Well, certainly um, and, and I just want to want to just quickly just add that um, the compliance data by project still goes to the link for September 2020. So maybe that is just. Um, an oversight, um, and this is the link that the people okay. are presented with. So I just want to just flag that for you all. Thank you, Andre. We'll, we'll definitely track that down. Um, I'll turn it over to Chris to talk specifically about Mario, Susie, and Sons. Um, and then to your other question, we do uh, partner with the unions. Um, it, it's still, to be honest, a, a project that... Um, our jobs bank coordinators getting off the ground, but to have regularly regular job fit, not job fairs, but kind of enrollment fairs. We do hear some unions are proactive about telling us, you know, we don't currently have any um, resident workers. We will take apprentices. We actually just got an email like that last week, but we need to tighten up that communication so that when we find a resident that's interest in jo interested in joining a union, we can just send them their way and they don't tell them, oh, you have to wait another year or, or whatever the process is. So those are relationships that we're still forming and strengthening. Uh, we have had a couple of successful fairs where people were able to find out about the different unions, the different requirements um, and join if, if they were ready or, or get support through, through other programs like Building Pathways or Operation Exit. And so, but I think we, we need to make that something more regular and it's something we're working with our jobs bank coordinator on. Um, and I think that, that those strengthening that communication from the unions is really important in terms of getting people into these pipelines for, for these projects. So um, it's something that we would love to work with you on. Um, and anyone else here. Um, and I'll turn it over to Chris to, to just add to anything I've said and, and to the specific question about Mario, Susie, and Sons. And, and before you go to Chris, I just kind of want to follow up on something you just mentioned that I'm curious, it's two things. One is, you know, I've also heard um, from folks, um, uh, specifically our returning citizens, right? Um, and creating meaningful pathways for them to be gainfully employed. And I'm just curious what efforts, you know, we can strengthen um, to to ensure that our returning citizens have viable employment opportunities. And then um, accountability with the unions too. I mean, everybody plays a role in this process in terms of kind of making sure that we are fulfilling our, our, our requirements. And I'm just curious what, if anything, on the compliance end when um, it's not just the contractors, but it's also the unions that are not doing their fair share. Um, to to ensure that they're doing their dual diligence to hire um, people of color um, and Boston residents. Um, so just curious about kind of what that accountability and compliance looks like and how are you holding unions accountable to that work as well? Yeah, and I, you know, I think this is something that um, the the lack of transparency is really a challenge because without knowing, you know, what the pool is. It's the same thing. We had to do the availability study for the city for on contracting, like who's actually out there that performs the type of work that we need for these projects. And so I think that that we really need to strengthen that. And I, I do think the for me, and, and this is sort of the organizer in me. So so just like this isn't a systemic approach, which is my role, but this is the organizer in me is that the best way for me to kind of test the system is if I have workers, if you bring me workers that want to join a union or that want to get work and then I send them and then they get rejected, then that's like a real life case for us. So we, we really look for anyone. I feel like whenever I reach out to the unions, they're like, if you have anyone, send them our way. But I'd like to actually put that into practice. And so the more workers that we can find that want to join a specific union or or maybe they don't even know a specific union, but they want to pursue a specific type of work, 
um, we will really push them and see, you know, um, that's that's sort of the trial to see if the system is working. But obviously, there's more systemic approaches where we need to better understand um, which trades have available workers, which ones don't, and how to how to um, diversify those pipelines. Um, so I think we need to do both, kind of the systemic approach, but also bring the workers to our jobs bank so we can really proactively try to get them into um, the unions or other work opportunities. And I, before my time goes up, I know that Chris is going to answer the last question, but I just want to also know that, you know, we have Madison Park, which is supposed to be the gem here. And uh, uh, I, I think the best pipeline um, and, and gives us an opportunity to put literally our money where our mouth is um, to to resolve this issue. And I just feel like we, we keep talking about it, but there are some programs that I just don't understand the, the why. And, and I'm so sad that Travis is going to be leaving us because, you know, I've learned so much from you, Travis, in, in these hearings. And so really do appreciate all the work that you've done. And um, I, I just think that accountability and transparency is going to be key, but more political will and making sure that um, that we're being more uh, forceful, if you will, in, in the enforcement piece of it. Um, but I, I won't I won't take up too much of my own time here. I just want to just give Chris an opportunity to answer the question around um, the SUSE folks and, and what's up with them. Thank you, Councilor Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Actually, Mario SUSE, we've been working with Mar Mario SUSE over the last 10 years, and it, they, the numbers have increased. Um, I can send you the data. Um, for those that don't know, Mario Susi is um, a public works contractor, sidewalks, streets, and the numbers have increased. I can send you the data after the hearing, and we've been working with Mario Susi on, on their workforce. And I just want to talk a little bit. You had mentioned Madison Park, and what I'm seeing is uh, we need to get people trained, and Madison Park needs to be uh, stood up. and. Also, I'm gonna go a little bit further. I think we need to build a training facility in Boston, meaning we need um, other towns have, uh, they, they have um, training trade schools, right? And if someone wants to get a trade right now from Boston, they have to go outside of Boston. Boston does not have a trade school. And this is just coming from me, in my opinion, not only do we need to stand up Madison Park, but we need to invest in building a trade school. There's a lot of, there's a lack of skills. A person can't just, you know, wait, you know, there's a lot of unemployment, right? But a person needs to be trained before they can work on these job sites. They're not gonna just, a contractor is not gonna hire a person and just put them on a the backhoe. They need a license. And for same as a plumber, electrician, in my opinion, we need a trade school. We need to get people trained. If, they, if we can get them trained, then in my opinion, they, they're going to be working on, on job sites. Councilman here, are you OK uh, with movement? Or did you have a? I, 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 um, I don't want to take up too much space. I, I feel like I've, I'm, I've used my seven minutes. Um, I, I, I'm good. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. If you have any more, we'll come back. But I'm just going to go to uh, Councillor uh, Braden, then Councillor Flynn is on, and Councillor Bach. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you all. And, and thank you to Travis. I, I really appreciated the historic overview of where we've come from and, and how far we've still got to go in terms of this policy. Um, I, I think the last time we had this hearing, we talked a lot about the pipeline, and it's one of my... Uh, one of my goals is to really ensure that uh, our high schools, uh, we have Brighton High out here in Alston Brighton, just to make sure that we are um, encouraging young people to take a broad view of their career paths and to have career path opportunities that would lead them into the trades uh, and into these good paying jobs in, in um, uh, and that they are good paying jobs that will allow them to be able to stay in the city. And um, it's really, really critically important. The other thing I do when we have, when we are working with developers to work on 
and the BPDA to develop uh, cooperation agreements. We do have them make a commitment to the Boston jo Resident Jobs Policy in their cooperation agreements. Again, the question for me is, how, are we actually imp uh, monitoring those, and are, are, is it not is it actually being enforced? You know, are, are they delivering on that commitment in the cooperation agreement to to do that? So. I really feel that you know the, the 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 development of the pipeline. I think Madison Park is is a critical piece of the puzzle, and I had a conversation with some folks from Madison Park. Uh, maybe it's a while ago now. Maybe in the spring, um, they did a presentation about their academy, which also you know is Madison Park is a Boston public school, uh, tech and vocational school. Maybe we need to look at that 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 that. That's that status and and see does it does it need to transition into be a full blown trade school and um, uh, I, I I think that you know the excuse that we haven't got an adequate pipeline is is old we have to really we have to really be much more aggressive and and proactive and ensuring that all of our young people who want to take this career path and even to consider it as a career path um, that they have the uh, opportunity to look that and and try out uh, experience. Um, you know, shop and and get exposure to um, those skills, so that they would consider a job in the trades as a, as a possible uh, career path. So, you know, I really applaud all the great work. Um, I think we have a lot to do, and um, I have to give a shout out. I'm I'm so delighted that this this policy includes women because, uh, you know, I think uh, underrepresentation of women in this in this space is is, is historic and. Uh, I'm glad that that's that that's considered as an, an important piece of the the puzzle, and and to bring women into the trades is is hugely important. So uh, you know, I think the Madison Park issue, we just need to keep hammering on that and and see if we can really develop a robust pipeline. Those are I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. You know, how are we, are we making any progress, and um, and what what else what else do we need to do? We need to start pushing uh learning from best practices in other places that, that have worked and and see how we can get past this pipeline issue because it's not a it's not a, a valid excuse at this point thank you thank you um i didn't know if anyone wanted to talk about the pipeline uh specifically uh the issue and then we'll go on to councillor flynn Chris, I know that that's a passion of yours if you want to uh, respond to Councillor Braden. Ours, a passion of ours, but you're more the expert on it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like I mentioned previously, I, I just think that skills are important, whether it's in construction or whether you want to be an accountant. Uh, right now, it's a, you know, it's a, there's some risk involved with, uh, let's just say, non union contractors in. Most of the individuals that we're getting in a jobs bank are laborers, 95% of them. They're unskilled uh, workers. They're, they're laborers. And I just think that skills are important. And if we could uh, stand up Madison Park, if we could, uh, you know, get a trade school going, not only for high school individuals, but from the ages of 18 to, say, 30, uh, in the Boston area, uh, maybe partner with the unions. Uh, and, and also it would give the non-union contractors a resource to go to, to get, you know, to get individuals with, at the very least, basic skills. Because if you have a contractor, electrical company, they're, they, you know, instead of just hiring somebody off the street, at least if you had a person that went through a program, you know, have a, like a certificate as an electrician, that would be a, a person that maybe that non-union company would, you know, give a shot to. So I just think training skills, and right now you have to go outside of Boston to, to go to a trade school. We, we don't have a trade school in Boston. I think it's just important to, to have a, you know, a place where people can go and get the, at the very least, the basic skills. Chris, just a point of interest, uh, where is the nearest trade school in the greater Boston area? How far do people have to go? Mm. 
Well, I know there's uh, for the letting, it's one out in Lawrence. I, I think there's one out, don't quote me, but it, it, I think the closest one is at least 20 miles from Boston. Yeah. Uh, I know there's one up on the North Shore. I think there's one out west, but I think it's, a, I can get, you know, I can give you the, the names of the trade schools, but I, I think they're at least 20 miles from Boston. Very good. Thank you. Madam Chair, that's all the questions I have for now. Thank you. Um, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, um, Councillor Edwards. And again, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for their testimony and leadership on this important issue. I see Chris is doing an excellent job, Travis and Selena. So I just want to highlight, highlight their work and their dedication to this to this issue. Um, I guess my, my question is similar to Councilor Braden's um, on on trade and technical opportunities. I went to a Don Bosco Technical High School and, and it's and it's closed now. Um, but I was may, maybe Chris might might be able to tackle this one. Chris, um, the the and, and I'm a strong supporter of Madison Park. I, I think we need to make sure it's as successful as it possibly can be. And we need to make sure we have the resources and money that, that goes into it. So I guess, Chris, um, the, the program out in Worcester, the, the high school in Worcester, uh, the trade school, um, what impact does that have on students that graduate from that high school being able to get into into the trades from after graduating that does that have a, a huge impact on the on the young people coming out of that high school and then and then going into a job just wanted to see if you may have followed that that issue closely yeah so i haven't followed that issue closely but um in terms of working in Boston, I, I, I would think most of the, the the kids or young adults that are in that school in Worcester, most of them are not Boston residents, so they would be working in the Worcester, the Worcester area, and it probably would end up negative negatively uh, if they did work in Boston. I'm, I'm sure some do uh, neg negatively affecting the BRJP program. Yeah, but uh, I, I just think and. I'm going to say it again. I've, I've been around for a long time. And so we're, we don't have people knocking on the door, holding signs, uh, saying, I'm not working right now. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing skilled workers knocking on the door, calling us and, say, and telling us that they're not working. That's not happening. Anyone that has skills, they're working. Uh, it's the unskilled untrained individuals that we need uh, to get up and running. And again, that would be through some type of training, whether it's through the unions or whether we go through Madison Park. And and I think there's a gap between, because Madison Park is for high school students for the most part, right? What, what about the person that's between 18 and 30, which there's a void. Uh, I, I just think that's the area that we need to concentrate on. Uh, the high schools are important, but I think that that age between 18 and 30 is a critical age. And I think if we had a trade school um, uh, that would able to provide skills, I, I, I think that would do a lot for, for this program and for the city of Boston, to be honest with you. It's just my opinion. No, thank, thank you, Chris. And I, got, I have one, one final comment before this, before I was a city council, I was a probation officer for 10 years and I worked on reentry issues for um, men, mostly men, coming out of jail or, or, or prison. Um, and just want to see, it, it, it ask your opinion. I know the, the building trades are, are much more friendly and now than at any time for young men coming out of jail and prison. But I think it would be critical getting getting that group the necessary skills and training, uh, giving them another opportunity. 
to get back into the workforce, getting them back on their feet uh, to be a productive citizen uh, again. I think I think the job a job is the best way to do that, but certainly you need the training. So just just interested in hearing your thoughts or or comments on that. Chris, I think you might be on mute. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, a person is incarcerated, <laughs> they get out and if they don't have a skill or a trade, uh, they end up, you know, in some cases right back where they came from. So I think a partnership with the, the reentry program, a partnership with, uh, with, you know, with the with the in, in, with the jails or whatever, I think it's important. We need to capture those individuals that are getting out because most people that are that are locked up, they're not going to be there forever, right? They're going to get out. So if you're 23 years old and you're getting out and you don't have a skill, a skill, or you don't have a a trade or someone sponsoring you, you're going to end up, you know, going back to what you know. Uh, because everyone has to survive, you know, and if they're not able, you know, if they're not able to find employment, then, you know, in a lot of cases, they end up, you know, in the, in the same situation. So I think a partnership with um, with South Bay, for example, would be good. Uh, even before the person gets out, right? You wouldn't wait. It, it doesn't, you know make sense to wait until the person gets out. If the person's going to get out in six months, you start that partnership before that person get out with a trade school or a union or or a contractor. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Chris. And um, Council Edwards, I, I have no further co um, questions. I appreciate the panelists for their hard work and in, in, in leadership and just wanted to highlight one final issue as we've, you know, following this pandemic we're going to have a booming economy once again in the city we'll see these huge cranes up all over the city and if residents of boston communities of color and women are not part of that booming economy you know it's 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 it's, it's a complete failure if that happens um so we need to make sure that everybody benefits us from this booming economy in we see it in my district, especially on the South Boston waterfront, and it's it's critical that communities of color and women are are part of the construction jobs down there. So, just wanted to say thank you to the um, the panelists that are here. Thank you, Council Edwards. Thank you, and I do. Um, I, I, so I just had a couple um, suggestions. And I think uh, <clears throat> for the pipeline concern and it's highlighting some of the examples that are actually, I think we, we work. So um, the Suffolk Downs cooperation agreement, for example, um, in that the private developer agreed to commit um, $1 million to the, I don't know, building, uh, whatever the building um, pathways program to expand the seats there specifically for, um, I push, I'm still pushing for BIPOC folks in East Boston, but that's what the district city council is supposed to do. I understand they're gonna <laughs> expand beyond East Boston, but I am trying to prioritize, of course, my, my residents, my high school. Um, and uh, that's private dollars. And then the other set of private dollars they put in is a million dollars for ESL training. You wanna talk about a pipeline that we cannot forget. And that is about making sure that people are uh, getting trained in ESL. And this is modeled off a successful program from 32BJ, where they did, um, they committed to 10 years and a thousand people um, over those 10 years, each learning ESL in that time to make sure that whether it was for the eventual construction jobs that are going to only grow at Suffolk Downs or whether it's just for any job uh, and market that they're more prepared for by having ESL. So just making sure that the trades training isn't the only training and pipeline that our money is going to. And as we get bigger projects, which we will over in Dorchester at the, um, what is that former site, the big site uh, where 1199 was, you know, the big site, um, I'm forgetting the name of it. And then there's also uh, the, the huge PDA and uh, large land grab, as some people describe it, from Harvard University over in Alston Brighton. They're going to end up with looking at massive 
um, cooperation agreements and how we make sure that private dollars from the developers are leveraged to create the pipelines, the institutions. I think that this should be also part of our, our conversation. Uh, I think the city is doing what it can do in terms of, and your number one mission, is, mission, as I understand it, is monitoring, monitoring and monitoring. But if it's the pipelines that we also need to be creating, then I think we need to leverage some of this moment with our zoning and so on and so forth. And we did so at Suffolk Downs, and that is, that's an example we should consider for all major developments. The other pipeline that I think Councillor Flynn touched on and what, what I think we should consider um, with working with our, um, our, our street workers and those who are um, already doing the amazing work on the ground um, in terms of um, moving our youth towards more positive um, places and our youth jobs is how are, how are we connecting the 4,000 new youth jobs that we're creating in the city of Boston, right? And we're funding to some more pipelines into the trades. Are, are we creating that bridge? Um, should we look at creating that bridge a little bit stronger? Um, because we know who majority of those youth jobs are going to, right? And that's a good thing. I believe that there are majority of kids who are um, BIPOC kids and, and women and young women as well. And so if we're creating a job experience, you know, why aren't they also being kind of, I know, I don't know how we are creating more jobs uh, or connecting the two. Also, in terms of um, working with courts, working with um, some of our um, the juvenile court system, in terms of deferment, in terms of probation, in terms of just being able to have programs and pushing people. I'm talking specifically the older teens. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Chris, or Mr. Brown, excuse me, the 18 to 25-year-old, that sweet spot of age, that, that's the age. And I know we were trying to increase some of our youth jobs a little to be a little older, but that sweet spot of age is the where you can grab, defer, move. And I would hope that we start talking to some courts um, about probation, about you know avoiding any you know if they make a, a youthful mistake is what a lot of them are making. <laughs> um, that's what it is. It's not a character issue. It's a youthful mistake. And so how do we make sure that okay, as an exchange for uh, a pipeline to prison or a pipeline to institutionalization, we're pipelining that core group of kids, young people, I should say, young adults, over into uh, job training. You know, I, I, you know, Roca is 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 doing some you know partnership with that. I know that that's a sweet spot for them. They specifically work with even um, more um, heavy needs youth at that level. But I think there's that's a pipeline that we're not um, aggressively tapping into that I think that if we were to work with, um, and it's as simple as, you know, setting up like they did with drug courts, they set up pilot programs and one, one, one judge committed to it. And then it kind of grew. I know we can find some judges. I know we can find district court judges who are willing to partner and say, okay, this is part of the pipeline away. So those are my two suggestions for the pipeline. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of, I thank God for the sales force finally getting up there to institutionalize the monitoring a little faster so we can get real, real time um, fines going out. I think that's been my recurring theme consistently from day one. Um, and so I'm excited to continue to have this. I'm, I want to say also, since we've started these hearings, the, the city's response, the department's response, the cohesive like presentation has only gotten better, which to me means that it's becoming a culture of the ordinance, right? The, the biannual meetings, April and October. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys for that and being so prepared and ready to go. Um, I hope the next time we meet, we're talking about you know in you know pipelines that are coming up in April that are a little bit more um, uh, you know creative. I know you guys are doing the CSL class. That's great. I know you guys are doing so many other um, you know in house which you can control. But these private developers need to be part of this table too, and they got the money too. So, those are my thoughts, and I hope we can, you know, continue to work together. I want to say thank you, Travis, for your service, for your thoughts, for your you kept it real all them years, and you kept it. Uh, you shine a lot of light on some issues, comments, and people who were not helpful, and I think that takes a lot of bravery and courage. A lot of people think that it's easy to do that. It's actually easier to just say nothing and keep your head down. So thank you for being brave. Thank you for being courageous. Um, I hope 
whoever becomes mayor does hear your recommendation about who should be uh, your successor. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor. I've been uh, forever grateful for the opportunity. Thank you so much. So with that, unless anyone has any additional comments, questions, we're going to, this was the October meeting for the Boston uh, Residence Job Policy. We will um, be having the uh, April meeting according to the um, ordinance uh, next year with some, hopefully, some more data, some more pipelines. So thank you all. I have a question that I would like to ask if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, Christopher, you spoke of skills and you spoke of a new um, building development of a trade school. That resource could be put towards Madison, as you said, to uplift it. Um, and I agree with you. You go down Blue Hill, down the Blue Hills, there's a trade school way down there that has a waiting list. And we have nothing here in the city for our young adults and adults. But a question that I have for you, because you uplift the unions, um, and I know for a fact, and I would definitely, <clears throat> excuse me, be reaching out to, to Ms. Selena because she made a statement about having concrete evidence where you go to the union and you, you say that we have X amount of workers, and we did. We had 10 workers, and we worked with, with um, we had a conversation with the unions, and it started out, yes, 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 but when it came time, to put their money where their mouth was, they backed off. They says, oh no, we can't do that. Blatantly, no, we can't do that. And that only that happened maybe two years ago. But the point I want to make is <clears throat> unions usually have apprentice programs and we can't even get our members of the community, our black and Hispanic and women members of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, in these programs, how are they supposed to get skills? That's one. College is not for everybody. Everybody can't afford to be able to go and get a take a certificate program or what have you. That also takes time, and most people have to work to put food on the table, keep a roof over their head, so on and so forth. So that time that they're going to take to go to a certificate program, you know, is where they're supposed to be gaining some kind of income to feed their children. If the unions were at least to allow access, and I say allow, and I use that word very gingerly, uh, but open the doors for access for residents to at least be in an apprentice program, it is a stepping stone to learning a trade, becoming, you know, skillful. But we don't even have that. And mind you, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that that's the beginning or the end. But we need a little bit of everything. We, we need the puzzle and be able to fill in the pieces to create a whole. So as much as the unions are good jobs, they are the last one that opened their doors to us. And I'm talking about all the trades, you know? So that's something that we definitely have to visit. To um, Councillor Edwards' point, yes, when developers come into Boston and they're gonna build something, we need to talk about community benefits. And I'm not talking about artwork or bench, benches or trees. All of that is good, but hello. You know, I'm talking about what is going to help me, help my family, help build my community, you know? So th that, that was a, oh, and one last thing, the breakdown of, um, I see that the data was given for the breakdown of active projects. And if I'm not misquoting the people of color, I despise that word, but um, I'm going to leave it alone. The the blacks and Hispanics and 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 and, and um and women in our community that that's on this job, I see there's like 68 percent 
um, for neighborhood development. And, you know, the numbers are nothing like we see in Roxbury. But my question is, how is people of color being broken down? You know, um, because we know, we know, I don't have to give a little history of what people of color comprises. And I don't have to give a history of why the BRJP was formulated. So it would be good to know the demographics, the breakdown of BIPOC. And on that, thank you very much, Councillor Edward. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, we will convene uh, again in April. We'll have these continued conversations. Um, I think all of us had expressed our gratitude to Travis. I'll just say it again in, con in conclusion. Thank you so much, Travis. All right. A pleasure yeah. and an honor. Take care. Bye-bye.